We're going to have scripture reading and prayer by the chaplain, after which we will pledge allegiance to the flag. Our chaplain this morning will be introduced by the gentleman from the 15th District, Chairman Paul Battles. Chairman Battles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a joy for me this morning to introduce the chaplain of the day. Uh, before I do, I, this is the first time I've had an opportunity to um, somewhat introduce my wife. She is here this morning. Uh, would you stand? Don't overdo it. Uh, Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, and I, the reason why I wanted to um, introduce her is because uh, this past December, just a month ago, we celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary. So, and her mother said it never last. So. We have another beautiful lady that is here this morning who is actually the wife of our speaker today. Uh, Carrie Morton is here, and you will immediately recognize that in just three, three and a half, two and a half, three and a half months of being at First Baptist Church of uh, Cartersville, she has added a new flower to our bouquet of, of flowers at our church, and I'd like to introduce to you Carrie Morton. Carrie, would you stand and let them greet you? Uh, they have three beautiful children. Now, I want to tell you about Carrie for just a second. Carrie is a pioneer wife. Uh, now, she is a very educated person. Matter of fact, she has a master's degree in counseling, marriage counseling. And uh, that's the reason why they have such a happy marriage. Uh, she counseled our speaker uh, every day when he gets in. Um, those of you who are married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, um, uh, but they have three beautiful children. And during the transition of moving from Perry, Georgia, uh, up to, to Cartersville, she had a baby uh, in the back of a covered wagon coming up 75. No, I'm just kidding. But she had to go through the transition of literally having a baby and then making a move to Cartersville, which is not easy just in the move itself. And uh, she's a very strong lady, and, and she is a, a, just a real dynamic addition to our church. On a serious note, um, most there's quite a few people in this room uh, know our speaker this morning. Uh, I found out after... Uh, our speaker decided to come to Cartersville that we were stealing him away from an area that uh, I wasn't sure whether or not I was going to be uh, congratulated or be uh, angry at, and uh, that was from our, our majority leader, Larry O'Neill. Uh, we actually got our speaker uh, from a pastorate there, moved him up, uh, uh, our speaker and Larry's son, actually went through school together, was on the golf team, and um, that's all I'm going to say, because that's all, um, that's all uh, he would tell me. But um, in introducing uh, our speaker this morning, there was a passage of scripture that's found in 1 John, the sixth chapter, I mean, the first chapter in the sixth verse, and it says, there was a man sent by God, and his name was John. And we know the first chapter of John talks about how that God was able to bring John to be the light of who then would introduce mankind to uh, Jesus Christ and his birth and his life. I'm so thankful that God is still in the business of sending people out to share the message. It is not by chance, it is not a fluke, but it is in the providence of God that our speaker that is here today came to 
Cartersville First Baptist Church. He was not looking for a church. Matter of fact, he was probably a little reluctant because all of his family live in that community where he pastored. Uh, he had finished his uh, college and his seminary work. Uh, he will soon be receiving his doctorate in, uh, in biblical preaching, uh, expository preaching to be exact. Uh, and there was no reason that people would think that he needed to stay uh, or, or to make a move. But God had a different plan. And I'm so thankful that he was willing to follow the plan of God because it's had such a dramatic impact on our church. And so without any further ado, uh, my pastor, my friend, Okay, I get it, I get it. Remember the other guy, he's not in the house any longer, and I'm trying to break his record. Without further ado, I want to, I want to, we've lost composure. I want to introduce to you my pastor, Jeremy Morton. After that, I'm not sure if the bar is high or low. Thank you, Mr. Paul Battles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. God bless you for being here, and I praise the Lord for this incredible opportunity. It was Sunday morning at the First Baptist Church, and the silver-haired 81-year-old saintly woman came walking down the center aisle. She had her cane in one hand, and her Bible in the other. She took her familiar place on the edge of the pew where she sat every Sunday. After she was seated, a group of rowdy, boisterous young men entered the room. And they sat in that section where the teenage students normally sit. And behind this group of rowdy boys, in slinked one of the slimiest, nastiest, filthiest, most disgusting characters you would ever imagine in church. He had jeans with holes in them. He had a tight black shirt with the word kiss mounted across the front. He had nasty, greasy hair. Everyone was suspicious of this unsavory individual. At the end of the service, when it came time for the preacher to give the invitation, that saintly 81-year-old woman with the cane in the Bible leaned over to her friend and she said, I'm disgusted with some of the characters in our church. Look at that deacon. I read in the paper this past week, he's been convicted of fraud, embezzling. Look at that lady in the choir. She's on at least her fourth marriage. Look at that girl sitting with the teenagers with the tattoos all over her body. Pregnant. Out of wedlock. But most of all, look at that slimy figure behind those teenagers. I heard he's a sex offender. I'm so glad I'm not like these people. I teach Sunday school. I faithfully pay my tithes. I gave $10,000 to the building program last year. And I'm in prayer group every Wednesday. The preacher asked everyone to stand and sing at the time of the invitation. As everyone stood to sing, only one person remained seated. It was that slimy, filthy, nasty character. He was overwhelmed with emotion. His heart had been pierced by the truth of who he really was. As everyone sang, that slimy individual buried his head in his hands and all he could mutter to say is God have mercy on me, a sinner. 
God, I am wrong. I am filthy. And I cry out, oh God, have mercy on my wicked heart. The silver-haired 81-year-old woman left church that day. The slimy, shady figure also left church that day. But only one of them left right with God. Jesus tells a simple story just like this in the Gospel of Luke. It's found in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Bible teachers have noted that this parable, this story called the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector is located in Luke's travel narrative. It's this narrative of scripture that points to Jesus laying down his life on the cross. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And in preparing to die for the sins of the world, he's teaching his disciples that you must also lay down your life in service to your fellow men. Luke says he tells this story of the Pharisee and the tax collector to people who thought they were righteous, who were self-righteous and trusted in themselves. Maybe in this room today we wouldn't have to look too far to find someone who's a bit self-righteous. You compare yourself to others. I'm more educated than him. I've been in this house longer than her. I have more in my bank account than this individual. I'm successful. They're not. It was precisely to people like this. Jesus said, look at this Pharisee. He comes into the room saying, I fast, I pray, I'm faithful, I'm good. I'm not like these filthy, sinful extortioners. But the tax collector, a fraudulent, one who knew he was a liar, one who knew he had been a phony, beats his chest. He's broken with emotion. Oh, God. Forgive me, a sinner. Jesus says only one of them left the temple justified, right with God. And then Jesus makes this statement that perhaps captures the message of the gospel more than any other statement in the world. Jesus says this in Luke 18, 14. If you exalt yourself, you will be humbled but if you'll humble yourself I will exalt you if you exalt yourself if you are self-righteous if you've put yourself on a pedestal if you're believing your own press if you're the smartest person in the room if you're the wealthiest person among all your friends and you think you're better because you are you will be humbled. But if you come low, if you come acknowledging your need, if you come acknowledging that apart from God's mercy, you won't survive this day, Jesus says, I'll bless you. The wisest man that ever lived said this in Proverbs 16, 18. And in Proverbs 18, 12. And in Proverbs 22, 4. Pride goes before a fall. And an arrogant spirit before destruction. James says in James 4, 6. God is opposed to the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. If you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. But if you'll humble yourself, God will bless you. I close with this, precious, faithful lawmakers. Nothing in the world is more dangerous than a man or woman full of himself or herself. Nothing in the world is more dangerous than an individual full of pride and self-righteousness. But listen to me. 
Nothing is more powerful. Nothing is more beautiful. Nothing is more glorious than a man or woman humble, modest, full of the spirit of Jesus. Exalt yourself. Be humble. Or be humble. And at the right time, God will exalt you. Let's pray. Oh God in heaven, as perhaps the most powerful body of men and women in Georgia today, convening for very serious business. We say, we long for humble character. We long to be modest. We need, oh God, to recognize that apart from you, we can do nothing. Forgive us for boasting in wealth and power. Forgive us for self-righteousness. Forgive us for connecting our identity to fleshly achievements instead of integrity and character and things that money and education and popularity will never afford. Oh God, I pray for this wonderful group of men and women. Give them your wisdom. I pray Micah 6, 8, 6, 8 over them that they would do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with the Lord, their maker. Bless Speaker Ralston. Bless Governor Deal and all of these wonderful leaders. Oh Jesus, today, would you move our hearts to humility that your name would be glorified in our land and that the people we represent would be blessed. We need your favor and your help and your mercy more than anything. So empty us of self that we might be filled with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pledge our allegiance to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the